Welcome everybody uh, to the state of production machine learning uh, in 2023. Uh, I am really excited uh, to be talking about a very broad range of very relevant topics um, across the machine learning ecosystem. Um, and uh, we'll be able to delve into uh, content that you will be able to um, yeah, revisit later on uh, with the resources provided. Um, you will find the slides uh, in this link at the top right. So yeah, if you missed uh, some of the uh, talk, you'll be able to um, you know catch up on on that uh, on your own time. A bit about my uh, about uh, about myself. Uh, so my name is Alejandro. I am uh, director of technology uh, at Zalando, uh, a, uh, a, a large tech company uh, based in Europe, uh, based focusing mainly on e-commerce. I'm also a scientific advisor at the Institute for Ethical AI and Machine Learning, um, a research center that um, contributes to um, policy and standards for the responsible development, deployment, and operation of machine learning systems. And I'm also a governing council member at large uh, at the ACM, where I contribute to, to policy as well as um, to uh, strategic initiatives uh, related to uh, AI. Um, and yeah, like I said, um, you know, this talk is actually going to be referencing a lot of uh, material, including uh, several of my previous talks at previous uh, Pi Data uh, and other conferences. So you will see any references here. And because it's a very broad um, overview of the state of production machine learning, uh, we'll be covering a lot of content. Each of the slides is basically kind of maybe like a summary of, of an entire deep dive. So you'll be able to uh, delve into, into that um, um, you know, as you find most interesting. So yeah, let's, uh, 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 oh, before we dive into, um, I also uh, collected a couple of uh, relevant talks that you may be interested about. So things across responsible AI, uh, explainability, machine learning monitoring, metadata, as well as machine learning security uh, that you'll be able to, to dive into. So the key uh, points that we will be covering today include the motivations and challenges, the industry and domain trends, some technological trends, some organizational trends, and then we're gonna be wrapping up. So let's dive first into the motivations and challenges. So one thing that has now become more or less consensus is that the machine learn the life cycle of a machine learning model does not finish once you train it, right? Once you actually achieve that performance metric, whether it's accuracy, precision, recall, whatever it is, um, uh, uh, you know, RMSE, whatever, whatever kind of like metric that you have, um, once you actually finish training your model, um, it doesn't finish there, right? The life cycle of the machine learning model actually begins once it's trained and once it's actually being used uh, uh, in production or in the particular use cases. And the interesting point about this is that there are a large number of uh, considerations uh, that have to be taken into account when we move into this uh, different uh, uh, space you know, whether it is things like outliers, changes of the data itself, distributions, uh, uh, concept drift, uh, um, you know, the reproducibility components, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, this is basically some of the, 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 the hints of things that we're gonna be delving into. But if we ask the question of <clears throat> why is production machine learning so challenging? I mean, there are a large kind of like laundry list of reasons, but some of the uh, key uh, uh, areas that we can uh, highlight here is different to, for example, traditional software, right? And, and traditional um, microservices, for example, is that there is a need for specialized hardware, <clears throat> right? So things like GPUs, TPUs, but also uh, models that may require extra amount of compute or extra uh, uh, large amounts of memory uh, to run and to be able to load them, right? Even like, like RAM memory. Um, um, as part of this, um, there is also the complex data flows, right? Like different components, different pipelines that are being productionized or different machine learning systems, as, as we'll be explaining later down the line, that actually have different uh, uh, steps where something that goes wrong could affect things, uh, you know, down the stream, or so even up the stream. There are co con con considerations around the compliance, right? Um, um, that allows, that, that brings, um, you know, questions around uh, things that you may have heard, uh, like AI ethics, uh, the, the, the challenges that we'll actually cover in a bit more depth uh, in a bit, uh, but also things like reproducibility, right? How, how do you make sure that whatever you ran last Tuesday is going to actually run again if you want to uh, like debug it or you want to rerun it, right? So 
these are some of the, the higher level challenges, but it actually goes into the domain as well, <clears throat> right? Because uh, when it comes to machine learning use cases, um, they tend to you know, tackle particular um, um, you know, areas uh, that could also create uh, potential uh, challenges and potential risks that have to be taken into consideration. And we've seen, uh, you probably have seen also uh, areas like algorithmic bias, um, more traditional things like software outages that can affect machine learning systems in different ways. Um, uh, personal data uh, in itself and the considerations around that when it comes to, to machine learning uh, and, and AI, as well as the cybersecurity uh, nuances that we'll also be delving into. Um, but yeah, uh, with this, we have to remember that, that you know, the impact of a bad solution can be worse than no solution at all. And uh, this is also why we care uh, and why we should care about uh, this uh, in, that, in that sense. And that kind of adds another element uh, uh, to the mix, which of course, you know, we weren't gonna talk about the state of production machine learning without mentioning, uh, you know, LLMs or generative AI. Uh, but one thing that I do wanna call out uh, that will be re relevant throughout the talk is that when it comes to um, um, the uh, architectural patterns that um, are arising in the rise of uh, LLMs, more specifically this agent chain architectures that we'll talk about later, they are a very good way of visualizing and getting an intuition of these production challenges of machine learning that goes beyond the LLMs, right? And we will talk about uh, some of the, 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 the nuances there. Now, in terms of the uh, roles, we also have to take into consideration that in order to tackle and, and understand what the nuances uh, and requirements for production machine learning are, are the different responsibilities. So traditionally, we have the data scientists, the DevOps, the software engineering, but now we're seeing the rise and the standardization of the machine learning engineer and also of the machine learning uh, of the MLOps engineer. And we'll reference a little bit more of that in the, in the organizational trends. But then you have this new role and it, it, it has also extended into the higher level around that intersection of the industry domain expertise and the policy expertise to bring in what are those AIML standards or best practices. So this is actually something that is, that is important because you know, it, is, it is going from a best practice locally to a best practice that becomes uh, 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 more adopted. <clears throat> So that is one of the high levels of why, why should we care. Now, in terms of, uh, you know, some of the industry trends that we see is that we're starting to see, you know, kind of uh, the way that, that I like to think about it, 2016 and, and, and around those dates were the dates of the principles where every organization was publishing a principle and a set of guidelines. Um, however, as it progressed, then it moved from, uh, you know, this, this, this sort of more higher level into more, you know, kind of like uh, um, industry standards, reg regulatory frameworks. Right now, we're actually starting to see some frameworks within, uh, you know, Europe to actually come to life uh, for regulatory compliance. And uh, we are also seeing the importance of uh, going one level even deeper on the software libraries, right? How making sure that the underlying foundations uh, are built in a way that actually are uh, possible to, to, to align with those higher level principles. But then we also have to think about it that uh, this, um, very kind of like important uh, 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 responsible ethical questions cannot fall on the shoulder of a single data scientist or a single single practitioner. And even though it is important to make sure that, you know, as an individual, you can adopt best practices, uh, you know, making sure that you're uh, having the right domain expertise, the competence in the field, the competence in the area, professional responsibility, it also requires different layers, including that team delivery process, right? Cross-functional skill sets within the area, key domain expertise, accountability structures, principled alignment. But then it also goes uh, at a department or organizational level uh, where we're seeing that pattern of introducing, um, you know, governing structures, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, human touch points throughout, you know, AI systems, uh, human in the loop uh, requirements, and then also risk assessments, which we'll talk about uh, in a bit. As part of that, we also see, uh, as I mentioned, that uh, uh, policy is actually um, advancing at quite a uh, fast pace. And whilst before, uh, you know, we often uh, mention how regulation is playing catch up, we now see that it is the compliance that is uh, now aiming to, to, to align with uh, the regulation that is coming up. And uh, it has been really interesting to see a lot of those uh, frameworks that have been coming up um, um, across uh, the ecosystem um, that have uh, uh, in many, many areas uh, will be having some some positive uh, outcomes introducing uh, best practices, and uh, in this pyramid that I was talking about, <clears throat> what is really interesting is this is this alignment between those higher level principles and also the underlying foundation, right? Whether it's the open source code or the actual you know software code that is that is uh, developed for the for the particular use case, 
um, those principles are you know useless if the foundation is not in place, right? And <clears throat> this is actually important because it brings us as practitioners as a critical component in these uh, uh, discussions and areas, right? So as some uh, some of high level industry and the main trends, as I said, uh, you know, there's a couple of like uh, links. Uh, you know, one hour plus sessions where you will be able to like delve into a bit more detail if you're interested. <clears throat> so then diving into some of the technological trends, which I, I think, you know, I guess in this uh, session is a bit of the, the meat uh, of the presentation. Um, I want to just paint the picture, right? Like um, uh, uh, when it comes to machine learning frameworks and MLOps frameworks, uh, we remember all how it started, right? Like ultimately you all were uh, looking to, you know, pull kind of like a uh, one of the usual uh, um, suspects for the um, machine learning frameworks. You were basically running like a a, a usual, um, <clears throat> you know, CIFAR 10, and then, you know, you're able to kind of like get some insights of, of your model, then you can apply it kind of like into a notebook and, and uh, you know, rinse and repeat uh, as, as, as you're kind of like honing, honing down. Uh, of course, it's oversimplifying it, but, you know, this is kind of like how, how it started. But now if we look at how it's going, uh, we we are kind of like uh, uh, you know hit on the face with like so much choice and so much uh, set of like tools, frameworks, technologies, areas, uh, uh, components that we should that we could choose or we could not choose, right? And when it comes to kind of like navigating this ecosystem, we have to ask ourselves like how as practitioners can we really uh, navigate this effectively? One of the things that we have done uh, at the Institute for Ethical AI, Ethical AI, we published a resource uh, that has been growing really really fast. Uh, that has been aiming to collect some of uh, um, actively maintained and used frameworks in the machine learning space across different areas. You know, explainability, privacy preserving machine learning, auto ML, you know, visualizations, optimization, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, yeah, please do check it out. If you, if you find that one is missing, please contribute it. Uh, that is the beauty of open source. But this has allowed us to actually like delve into this question a little bit deeper. And we have found some resources that are pretty actionable and uh, can be quite practical. Um, before diving into those resources, let's first get take a step back and think about what do we talk about when we refer to the production machine learning ecosystem. And let's take what we could call an archetypal um, architectural blueprint, right? It's like, what could we reduce uh, machine learning in production to? Of course, super simplified uh, because, you know, it's never going to be this simple. But let's think about it first in this sort of concept where you have training data, your artifacts, and then your inference data, right? You will uh, want to actually perform uh, what would be experimentation, right? Whether it's in a notebook or in a distributed workflow manager, hyperparameter tuning, training, evaluation to, you know, use training data to create some models. You would then be able to want to actually make those models available, whether it's somebody clicking a button or having some sort of um, uh, programmatic way of delivering that, right? Whether it's building like the actual images or, 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 or running tests, et cetera. You want to productionize your models, right? And this could be perhaps whether it's real time or whether it's batch, right? And once you have that, you want to also advance, uh, add some advanced monitoring or, or, or just some usual monitoring, right? And we're going to talk about that. Um, as data goes through your models, as, as well as through your monitoring, you would be able to capture some of that data, which then you would be able to, you know, have a full cycle in the ideal world. And of course, throughout this, you have metadata flowing uh, from end to end, right? However, when we ask the question of like, hey, well, what tools should we be adopting? One thing that one uh, uh, component that we have found that is very useful is this MyMLOps tool, which basically creates some kind of uh, components that uh, serve as the uh, sort of like, yes, archetypal um, 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 areas where you can uh, choose and swap different tooling, right? So here you would have your experiment tracking, experimentation, data versioning, code versioning, pipeline orchestration, model registry, serving, blah, blah, et cetera, et cetera. And you can pick and choose, um, you know, what would work best for you, for your organization. And sometimes, you know, when it's a very small kind of like context, you know, you actually probably do more harm than good, bringing too much uh, of a stack. But for organizations that are growing, you know, this is what often uh, has to be considered. Now, in terms of this sort of consideration, yes, we're thinking about the different components, but not only we see a shift in terms of the uh, uh, components that, that, you know, often are required to actually have a robust uh, framework. And of course, when we're talking about this canonical stack, um, this can also be a single end-to-end -end provider, right? Like, like a single one which has end-to-end -end coverage. And there is a lot of kind of like, you know, discussion of where it's best of breed versus kind of like end-to-end. -end. <clears throat> but ultimately, you know, a lot of the times there is kind of like context. 
But we're also moving into a situation where we're no longer productionizing a model, right? And this is what we are, what, what I was suggesting that um, the, the area of the LLMs actually visualizes quite well. But in the traditional, not traditional, but in the more kind of like common large scale machine learning applications, we see a situation where we're not productionizing a machine learning model, we're productionizing machine learning systems, right? And as part of this, you can actually see this is uh, the uh, embedding based retrieval uh, framework for uh, Meta uh, for actual search. You can see here that you have like an offline component that actually builds the embeddings that has multi uh, steps, even those quantization. You then have kind of like the online component, which does the, the ranking, the retrieval, the query processing. So here we're talking about, you know, a multi-stage complex machine learning system. And when you think about your infrastructure, you have to think about also this in mind. So this is actually something that now brings new nuances that brings us from not just the from machine learning model to machine learning system, but from model centric to data centric. And again, going back to this kind of like, you know, pointer of the LLMs is that the reason why I keep repeating it is because it's often hard to actually verbalize in an intuitive way this machine learning system component. But with the introduction of kind of like this agent chain architectures, it's easier to think about it, right? Like an LLM interacting with other APIs, orchestrating kind of like the interactions to be able to return a response uh, uh, requested by a user, right? So, so that is something that, uh, you know, is, 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 is allow, it would allow you to kind of like uh, build an intuition uh, on what uh, is meant by this uh, point. Now, of course, uh, there are considerations uh, when it comes to thinking about the concept of models. And uh, when it comes to a machine learning model, uh, we often think about it in the same way that, you know, a model, uh, um, a, a experimentation tracking system thinks about it, right? It thinks about it as the, the, the trained models. So let's think about, for example, we have an, a, set of data, uh, a set of data with data instances A1 to AN, and we train a, a machine learning model, right? Uh, we train machine learning model A with a subset right, of data. Now we train another uh, uh, machine learning model and then another one until we train M machine learning models with different sets of data, right? So this is what we're used to, right? Actually uh, being able to identify our machine learning models <clears throat> as artifacts and being able to store metadata about them, being able to like, you know, think about them and, and, and reason about them uh, this way. However, and yeah, uh, multiple different model B, et cetera. But now when you put these things into production, you have a new concept, right? You, let's say you deploy <clears throat> uh, model A, M in environment X, right? So here is, is an instantiation of your, of your artifact. But you may also instantiate that, I mean, I'm calling it instantiation, deployment into another environment, environment Y. And then you deploy a pipeline that consists of this model and this model, right? In another environment. Right, so here, the metadata that is involved here, the considerations that are involved here, even though you indeed are referencing the same machine learning model, you have a completely different relationship and different conceptual way of thinking of your production ecosystem, right? And this introduces new cons uh, uh, um, considerations when thinking about your, your production machine learning systems, because it really brings the hardest of machine learning with the hardest of traditional software you know, at scale, distributed systems, microservices, et cetera, right? So, but together. Um, and with that, you have, uh, you know, the whole host of considerations, right? One of them that we talked about was monitoring, right? So uh, monitoring itself is something that we would then have to introduce to all of these instantiations, right? Like your model deployed over here, your model deployed over there. So it's important to think about the monitoring in the same way that you would have with microservices, right? Like your performance, right? CPU, RAM, et cetera. Whether there's a memory leak, you can identify it but also machine learning specific uh, uh, nuances like statistical performance, you know, what is the, the, the accuracy precision recall when it's in production, the nuances of the data, um, kind of architecture that you need in order to be able to like, you know, uh, capture, um, um, you know, actual uh, labels um, and explainability techniques and drill down on metrics. But then it's also going from monitoring into observability, right? This is in things like introducing alerting, automated SLOs, SLIs, service level objectives, and then also having like automated way of production, I think things like, like progressive rollouts, canaries, et cetera. So, I mean, yeah, you, you, you can see here that there is kind of like a trend towards intersecting from the best practices of distributed systems, uh, large scale uh, software into, into the machine learning space. But the key thing is that, you know, as, as, as data science practitioners, we also want to not have to care about this. And we're talking to talk about uh, that a little bit more in the organizational side. Besides monitoring, we also have to consider security, right? And one thing that we have to know about security is in terms of trends, 
is that uh, uh, security is becoming now a big topic. And the reason why is because the area where you have to consider security is at every single stage of the machine learning pipeline, right? It's not only in the data cleansing, it's not only on the building of the model, it's not only on the deployment, it's at every stage of the machine learning lifecycle. And, uh, you know, again, <clears throat> one of the things that we have been able to see, uh, we published a resource called the MLSecOps uh, Top 10, uh, which is analogous to the OWASP Top 10. Now OWASP actually published their own top 10 for LLMs and for you know, traditional machine learning. So I would recommend you to actually check it out because even as practitioners, data science practitioners, machine learning practitioners, this gives you an intuition of <clears throat> what are some best practices that you can adopt and also what are some best practices that can be rolled out, right? Things around poison pickles on loading model artifacts, uh, uh, poison, uh, poison uh, data, uh, access to the model, how that can lead into things like adversarial attacks, uh, dependencies, bringing kind of like supply chain uh, and security into the into the play, et cetera, et cetera. So I do definitely recommend it. And we're running actually a uh, machine learning security <clears throat> um, com a committee within the Linux Foundation that is exploring these areas, which has had some really interesting um, outcomes there. Okay, so then uh, the final point, <clears throat> diving into some organizational trends. Um, so we talked about the technology side, but now let's talk about the organization, right? Because as machine learning practitioners, you know, you can't be a unicorn all the time every, everywhere, right? You can't have a data scientist that is handling all the productionization, all of the training, all of the experimentation, and all, all of the domain, right? Um, especially as organizations grow, you know, these are considerations to, to think about. And these are trends that we're seeing sort of like the industry consolidate towards. So one trend is basically moving from uh, trying to to take the uh, software development lifecycle, what you would normally use in your in your SDLC, and copy paste it into into your machine learning space. There is now a consensus that you know that shouldn't be the best approach, and then instead you should have a machine learning development lifecycle, which is more akin to a uh, fit for context, right? And you would basically be able to bring in uh, the, the the most relevant areas um, um, for the different components, right? So. Uh, that is one of the the, the, the the trends, is actually organizations bringing that standardization of process uh, uh, to be able to move their machine learning through their production line, let's call it. The second one is uh, an interesting intersection between the MLOps and the data ops departments. So in the data ops, you would have the concepts of like data mesh, how organizations are introducing analytics to be able to take advantage of uh, their uh, data ecosystem from an analytical standpoint. Um, but this is starting to intersect a lot into the machine learning production side and how to bring both of those worlds together, how to bring in the requirements of you know, data governance with also the requirements of machine learning governance within a single strategy, right? It's supposed to kind of like having a data strategy, a machine learning strategy kind of like completely separate. So this is another interesting organizational trend. The third one is, is kind of this concept of metadata interoperability. We talked about the different sort of like uh, heterogeneous systems that organizations often bring in not only often they bring in different um, like systems, but they may have different system for different units, right? And as part of this, what is important is to make sure that there's mm, sort of like homogeneity or standardization in how metadata flows across, right? Such that irrespective of whether you have heterogeneous components, you can have homogeneous interfaces. And there's something that we're seeing at the different uh, sort of like stages uh, and uh, areas of, of machine learning because it's a need that uh, you know organizations need to bring. Another um, uh, uh, concept organizationally is this mindset going from machine learning projects where you basically just deliver an outcome, deliver an answer, let's call it, right? You deliver an answer, moving into more of a mindset of products and bringing this product thinking into the machine learning space, going into this iterative agile uh, means of actually delivering incremental value uh, productizing uh, capabilities that then feed into themselves and, and iteratively allow uh, stakeholders or domain or users to actually work at a higher level. As part of this, then also comes the organizational structure. And we are starting to see this, the, the concept that is often you know, ubiquitous in the traditional software space around squads and like multi cross-functional squads coming into the machine learning space where no longer you may have just data analysts and, 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 and data scientists, but now you may have actually UX researchers, full stack engineers, machine learning engineers, machine learning researchers, MLOps engineers acting kind of like in a, in a very sort of like um, agile unit specific uh, uh, perspective. So that's another interesting one. 
Then actually mapping, of course, the technological outputs into the business outcomes, having different cadence for the different roadmaps around your iterative tooling development, your uh, you know tools and products that can be reused across other teams, and then also the infrastructure that is used across the board, right? And this, you know, even though it brings some initial kind of uh, effort and, and some potential kind of like slowdown, it introduces standardization that eventually speeds up uh, the outcome delivery. Now, in terms of the, the, the organizational shapes, um, one pattern that we see is that organizations tend to adopt too much too early in their uh, journey, right? So if you just have a small team of data scientists, it's very different to if you, and, and a few models, it's very different to having a you know larger group of, of, of data scientists with more models uh, and then you know a significantly larger number of data scientists with many machine learning engineers, right? So as part of you know going kind of like into that uh, stack, you also have to consider how you grow as 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 your uh, requirements develop, right? In terms of automation, standardization, control, security, observability, reliability, but also in terms of the roles themselves. And the roles themselves that we see is, like I said, right, is if you have a, a small group of data scientists, they can operate by themselves. As they start churning out significantly more models and they start uh, becoming busier uh, by just operationalizing stuff, that's when it's relevant to start bringing machine learning engineers to be able to own that, that, that space, right? To be able to create reusable pipelines. Now, as this even grow further, right, this is when actually having multiple different sort of considerations in, in terms of delivery of, of, of applied science, that's when we start seeing this role of the MLOps engineer bringing kind of capabilities at the platform level. So this is a very interesting trend that we definitely do see. And you can see that this, you know, can grow and grow and grow, uh, but these are some trends and some patterns that we see. So yeah, so those are some organizational patterns. Now, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the wrap up, what I just want to also highlight is that, yeah, when you're running around with a hammer, everything can look like a nail, right? And not everything can or should be solved with AI, right? There's a large number of problems in the world, and there's a very small number of solutions that should be kind of solving those specific problems. So that's something to think about as practitioners. And also the second thing, and just the thing that I want to kind of like close in, is that um, you know we have to be aware that now critical infrastructure is increasingly dependent on machine learning systems. However, regardless of how many layers of software and hardware and ML abstraction there is, the impact will always be human, right? At an individual, at a societal level. So that means that you know it doesn't matter how many chatbots or LLMs you're introducing, there's there's going to be indeed some automation, but it's not going to be kind of like removing completely. Uh, you know, everything from the equation. And the impact is still human, right? So that's something to consider as well. And with that, I want to thank everybody. Um, I hope you enjoyed this session uh, on the state of production machine learning in 2023. Uh, like I said, you can find the slides uh, in this link. Uh, uh, you know, if you, if you didn't manage to catch up a couple of con con concepts or, or areas, you'll be able to catch up at your own time. Um, and you can then visit also the links provided. So with that, uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alejandro. That was fantastic. Um, uh, I think we have time for a question or two from the audience, if anyone has any questions. Um, Alejandro, would it be possible for you to share your slides in Discord? Um, I actually don't have the link. Would you be able to help me with that if I share the link with you? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, thank you so much. Let me send it over. There you go. Thank you. I will post it on your behalf. And um, for those that would like to join the Discord, here is the invite link. Thank you. And, and I can see some really nice comments. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, nice comments in the chat. Session is pure gold. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Yeah, and then there's one on um, if we have some organization, some resources on organizational trends. Yeah, I mean, I'd love for there to be a bit more. Uh, I would say start with the slides and check the links because there's enough links to keep you busy. And there were a couple of links on the organizational trends uh, section. Yeah. I can see there's a quick question. Uh, do we have time maybe for like a one minute answer? Yeah, if we'll keep it quick. I'll put this on stage. Our squads, permanent teams are formed around projects. 
Yeah, that's a great question. So I would recommend you to check out the research from Spotify, which basically like that's where kind of like concept of, of, of squads, tribes, etc., was was presented. Um, they tend to be yeah temporary um, uh, and separate to the organizational hierarchical structure, uh, and they're set up for the particular process uh, pro, uh, 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 for the particular in, uh, uh, initiative. Uh, but yeah, I mean that explains it much better. And this is not now just a proposal to bring it into into machine learning and how we've been seeing it quite quite effectively. 